Hey everybody, and welcome to our hangout. Happy Earth Day! Well, this is the Online Ocean Symposium special Earth Day hangout. As many of you may know, Earth Day is an annual happening on which events are held worldwide to uh, demonstrate support for environmental protection and Earth issues. Today on the Online Ocean Symposium, we'll be chatting with a few groups about how each of us can make Earth Day a huge success and a day of engagement for our blue planet. First, let's introduce our guests. With me, I actually have the extreme pleasure to introduce Allison Cook, Director of Community Engagement for The Story of Stuff. Welcome, Allison. Hey, thanks for having me. No problem. What is The Story of Stuff? How did it get started? So The Story of Stuff is a, um, an organization where we make short format online movies about where your stuff comes from, how it's made, and the social and environmental impacts along the way. Um, we have partnered up with the great folks at Free Range Studios to basically tell the story of um, our kind of what we call our take make waste um, relationship to all the stuff in our lives. Mm -hmm. And the original movie was the, the Story of Stuff, which we released almost a little over five years ago now, with no kind of intention of, of doing anything beyond just kind of making a movie and telling the story. And what became really clear when we released the movie. Um, was that people were ready and eager and excited to have this conversation. So we kind of quickly put together the Story of Stuff organization and have continued over the last five years to make movies ranging from kind of is the issue of bottled water to corporate money and politics um, to actually looking at how do we make change on the issues that we care about. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. That's great to hear. I mean, that project is really fantastic. Uh, and it's really great to see that you're encouraging people to take action on their waste stream. Um, how much traction have you guys had? Uh, how much, you know, have people been paying attention to what you guys are doing? You know, how many shares have you had on your actual, or views have you had on your actual film? And what type of impact do you think you're actually having? I mean, it's it's been absolutely incredible, um, kind of, you know, Annie comes, Annie, who's the woman who speaks in all of the movies, um, you know, comes from 25 years traveling around the globe and trying to get people to care about where their stuff comes from. Um, and kind of it, with the story of stuff, it has been a kind of amazing success um, for us, thanks to the incredible community that has grown up around the movie. Um, our, we have a suite now of nine movies which have been seen collectively more than 38 million times um, and, and translated into dozens of languages around the globe. Um, there is a real and active and excited community of people who are working to fundamentally change the way that we relate to stuff in our communities and how it impacts the environments and communities that we care most about. And I would say that personally, one of the things that's so exciting about working here at The Story of Stuff and engaging in this conversation is getting to interact with people on a, on a daily basis who have this kind of deep passion and commitment and are kind of demonstrating it in the ways that our movies have kind of taken, taken hold. Um, and, and really, because everything is available for free online for people to use um, in their communities, it really kind of puts the tools in their hands to tell these stories in a way that makes sense to people. You know, we always joke that everybody speaks stick figure. Um, and so a lot of these kind of percentages and overwhelming pieces of information can kind of get condensed down into a story format that feels a lot more relatable to people. No, I, I, I know that I personally enjoy stick figures and find them very <laughs> relatable. And when I watch the story of stuff, it just really impacted me personally on, you know, thinking about my waste stream and the things I buy. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what the story of change is? Yeah, so we are constantly experimenting at the story of stuff. We're really fortunate in that we are constantly trying to figure out what are the issues that our community wants to know about. So we have an online community of about 400,000 folks across the globe who are kind of participating in this conversation. And one of the things that we kept hearing from our community was that they understood that there was a problem, they wanted to do something about it, but they didn't know where to start. Um, and so the story of change has been our kind of effort as an organization to talk about how we move um, to actually take action on the environmental, social, and political things that we care about to create, a, to write a different story and tell a different um, a, a different tale about the kind of world that we want to live in. And so the story of change is 
a uh, our newest and shortest movie that basically talks about um, kind of we say that you have a both a, a citizen muscle and a consumer muscle, um, mm -hmm. and that oftentimes when faced with incredible environmental or political challenges, people then ask, "What can I buy differently to solve this problem?" Um, but that the story of change says that kind of what you need to do is you need to kind of flex your citizen muscle um, to engage in community with the people that you care about um, on the issues that you care about to change the rules of the game so that the default option is the most sustainable, the most just, um, and going to bring about the, the biggest change to bring us closer to the kind of world that we want to want to be a part of. Really great endeavors all around. Um, the next question really before I go to the next uh, guest, uh, is there any big plans for Earth Day for the Story of Stuff project? I mean, I would say that, um, well, this this Earth Day, Annie is actually at UMass Amherst, and she's going to be giving a, a lecture uh, there tonight, which should be fun. She's a real um, firecracker. Um, but I would say for us, generally, Earth Day is just a, a kind of a reminder um, and a kind of touchstone to remind us of what is how, what is possible when people who care deeply about an issue come together. And um, when you look at the environmental victories of the 1970s, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, um, and just kind of the incredible efforts of people coming together to transform the political landscape around environmental protection. Uh, for us, I think Earth Day is, has, is part of that historical legacy in a, in a way that makes us feel um, kind of in, reinvigorated and re-excited about what we can do when we come together. You know, that's, again, really great, great into the theme of uh, Earth Day in general. Uh, for our next guest, I'd like to give a big welcome to Seth, Restoration Program Manager from Save the Bay SF. Welcome, Seth, and happy Earth Day. Well, thanks for having me. No problem. Well, what is the Save the Bay, for those who might not know? What type of impact does it have in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area? So Save the Bay is the oldest and largest nonprofit working exclusively to celebrate, protect, and restore the San Francisco Bay estuary. Uh, we were started in 1961 by three women uh, who were living up in the Berkeley Hills and looking out at the bay and watching it literally disappear before their eyes. Uh, because at that point, we were filling the bay and developing it uh, so quickly. Uh, and that was for agriculture up in the North Bay. Uh, and then, of course, all of this residential and urban development uh, in the Central Corridor and salt manufacturing in the South Bay. Uh, these three causes were causing bay loss at a rate so quick that if it would have persisted uh, up until today, the San Francisco Bay really would have turned into a river rather than this beautiful estuary that it is. So these women, they uh, started a grassroots movement. Uh, membership was just a dollar in that first year. Yeah, they got a hundred, or they got ten thousand people to uh, to join. And just a few years later, had a huge victory in um, establishing a, a legislative moratorium on filling of the bay. And prior to this, it was really a common pool resource. There was this tragedy of the commons occurring in the San Francisco Bay. Um, but they uh, they established this moratorium. Uh, as well as a state agency called the BCDC, Bay Conservation and Development Commission, uh, which is still around today and regulates shoreline development. So fast forwarding to the, uh, to the common day here, we're still working really hard to advocate uh, for responsible development around the Bay, if any, uh, and making sure that we're not filling in any more of the San Francisco Bay. Uh, we're also working on pollution prevention efforts through plastic bag and polystyrene bans. Uh, as well as trying to actively restore tidal marsh through a community-based restoration program. Um, that brings out about 6,000 people every year, uh, 2,000 students through our community-based restoration education programs, uh, as well as members of the general public and, uh, and corporate groups. We're uh, literally going out and uh, collecting native seeds, propagating about uh, 30,000 native seedlings, and installing them at wellland areas around the bay. Yeah, I actually have your uh, restoration education program website up right now. Can you tell us a little bit about how people at home can participate and join in uh, to help out? Absolutely. So we really have a, uh, an activity for everyone, and our activities are really seasonally linked as we are growing plants and installing them. Uh, so anyone can come out with their family or um, friends, community groups, 
through our public volunteer program, and you can sign up for any of those projects on our website, savesfbay.org slash volunteer. Uh, we also bring out a whole bunch of students, uh, fifth grade through twelfth, and have four different curriculum. Well, it actually looks like we just uh, lost Seth, unfortunately. While we wait for him to come back, let's move on. Our next guest, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jeff, who has developed an amazing way to fight litter and trash using social sharing. Welcome to the symposium. Can you tell us a little bit about Litterati? Thanks for having me, Andrew. Litterati is an organization that uses Instagram to crowdsource clean the planet one piece of litter at a time. And uh, it's a very simple process. You find a piece of litter, you shoot it with Instagram, you add the hashtag Litterati, and then you throw out or recycle or compost the litter. And what has happened quite quickly is that we have built something called the Digital Landfill, which is nothing more than a photo gallery of all the different images that people around the world are taking. Um, the other thing that we have built is a real-time map, <coughs> excuse me, which shows the exact location on the Earth where litter is emerging. And our idea is that we can use this data to really understand more about the litter and uh, leverage it in a way that can create programs to prevent it from ever um, gathering in the first place. Um, the final thing we've created is uh, statistics, um, which is really an index of the most commonly found brands and product types. And the idea here is to open up a dialogue with these companies to be collaborative and creative and say, listen, clearly your products on the ground are not good for the planet. It's also not good from a marketing perspective. So how can we work together? Um, and that's really uh, the nut and bolts of Literati. I have to say that I actually started using Literati a little bit ago and it's really quite addictive. I have shot a couple of photos. Here's one of mine right here that I found in Golden Gate Park. and you know, it's just a really great way to be impactful while still keeping a database of all these different items that I found in the different locations. Uh, have you found much traction on this? Are people buying into this? Are people using it? How many photos have you gotten so far? We just crossed over 8,000 on Saturday, which is, you know, a tiny amount when you think about the global problem. But it's a good start. And I loved what Allison said earlier, this phrase, citizen muscle that's effectively what this solution is. Um, the cleaning the planet is not going to happen with just a small people, a small group of people contributing. You know, we need everybody to play just a little bit of their part and we can actually make a massive impact. Most definitely. Everybody playing their part will bring about a awesome impact on our Earth. Now, I also understand that you are partnering with a specific organization in that right now for Earth Day. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we were really excited to announce an Earth Day partnership with Whole Foods. Um, specifically, their Oakland store has offered anybody who takes just one picture um, can come in and redeem a free cup of coffee. So it's about the easiest cup of coffee you could ever get, and it's obviously a win for you and I, and it's a win for Whole Foods, and most importantly, it's a win for the planet. Most definitely. So you hear that, folks? If you are in the uh, general area and you take a photo of litter that you pick up, take it to Whole Foods and you can get yourself a free cup of coffee. That's nothing to sneeze at. My next guest who has uh, shown up right now is Michelle from the Sierra Club SF chapter. Welcome to the program. Oh, it looks like you're actually mute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw it over to Seth to allow him to finish up a little bit about uh, what uh, Save the Bay is doing, and I'll help you out with unmuting yourself. Seth, can yeah, you tell us? Sure, uh, sorry about that. My computer shut down. Not sure where I lost everybody. Um, but I think I was probably talking a little bit about our, uh, our restoration education program, uh, which brings out 2,000 students every year to uh, engage in these hands-on restoration projects. And... Um, Save the Bay now, you know, we, we have this goal of trying to get to 100,000 acres of restored wetlands around the Bay. And historically, you know, we had over 200,000 acres, um, but we have lost about 90% of those wetlands. But uh, that is not to say that this is a, a static system out here and that we can't regain them. And so that's what we're doing 
actually through this restoration effort, uh, is actually going out and, and sticking plants in the ground, removing invasive species, installing the natives, and trying to establish really good uh, functioning wetlands and wildlife habitat out there. Uh, these wetlands, they're home to over 23 uh, endangered species, uh, 105 threatened species, including the California clapper rail, uh, which is kind of chicken size uh, bird. That there's, there's actually right around a thousand of those clapper rail left in the world. And they're all here in the San Francisco Bay. Also, you know, two thirds of the salmon that spawn in the state of California will pass through the bay. Uh, and it's a stopover on the Pacific Flyway uh, where millions of birds need to uh, need to rest and feed on their on their annual migrations. So areas these wetland areas provide fantastic wildlife habitat, but they also do a lot for us as humans. They are huge in uh, in protecting coastal communities uh, from floods, dramatic storm events, as well as sea level rise uh, as a result of climate change. Um, many of our communities are built right up against the side of a levee. Uh, we've all seen what can happen when those levees fail. fail. So it's uh, much better to have a big marsh there to, uh, to buffer against rising sea levels and tidal action. And finally, these areas act as really great filters for pollution. Uh, there's heavy metals in the bay like lead and mercury that can actually be sequestered uh, by bay mud. We find huge pieces of, uh, of trash, you know, a million plastic bags over a year probably blow into the San Francisco Bay. But these marshes can catch those uh, those big debris so that they don't end up in uh, in the bellies of uh, of wildlife. And you so actually, you, know, you add up all of these ecosystem services provided by our estuary, uh, and then monetize that, and look at what it would cost to replace each one of these services with an artificial means. So you know we build fish hatcheries uh, for all the salmon passing through the bay, and. Uh, um, pollution filtration plants for all of the stormwater runoff entering the bay. Um, if you were to do all that, you know, what would it cost us? And it would probably be about $23 billion a year um, that is provided for free by this resource. So that's really why it's so important to go out there uh, and connect people to our local wetland areas and give them a tangible, hands-on way to help restore them. That is some amazing efforts and some amazing facts and figures. Now that uh, Michelle seems to be back, let's throw it over to her again. Welcome to uh, the program. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, so sorry that I was running late. I actually was in a meeting, an environmental justice collaborative, about 25 organizations from all around the California. Uh, got a chance to sit down with the EPA this morning, and it was supposed to be over by 1130, and unfortunately it, it is actually still going on. There's a protest of about 100 people in front of the EPA demanding that they represent our most underserved communities and uh, basically stop corporate polluters that are really the cumulative impacts of years of abuse of, you know, uh, mining, now fracking, agricultural waste, and not to mention um, pollution from our freeways and our trucking industry that go to these largely agrarian communities, but also right here in the Bay Area. There are uh, the 880 corridor is renowned for having really high asthma rates in all of the communities around there. So it was a really powerful morning, but it did run over, so uh, my apologies for that, but that is part of what Earth Day is all about. Um, and uh, the theme, as, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Michelle, I'm the director of the San Francisco Bay Chapter of the Sierra Club. We are uh, America's oldest and most effective grassroots organizing uh, environmental nonprofit. And uh, we have worked a lot with um, many organizations um, all around the Bay Area and the country to fight to protect this, this planet. Um, we have a really broad focus and the way we are able to accomplish that is through volunteers. Uh, we have just in the Bay Area alone, we have about 20 different issue-based organizing committees that are actively working on issues such as regional transportation, uh, transportation and land use is their focus, uh, water conservation, also um, working to do things like protect the Bay and, and wetland areas, and, and hopefully we'll continue to work with Save the Bay on that initiative. Uh, one of our big Earth Day events is actually uh, something that's going to be happening in this room here at Sierra Club's National Headquarters at 85 2nd Street. On Wednesday evening, we have uh, someone from the Coastal Conservancy coming to talk about 
how we maintain living shorelines, which are the, the marshland that Seth was talking about in the face of climate change. So as sea level rise happens um, and people are worried about protecting important infrastructure here in San Francisco and, and around the Bay Area, there will be this idea that maybe we should build giant seawalls and levees. And what is sad is, and, and as Seth described so eloquently, really the best protection for uh, people and infrastructure and, and the best way to allow um, for a natural adaptation to climate change is to maintain a living shoreline that will come in a bit so you need to plan not to have uh, important resources really next to the water but allowing the shore to be porous and, and um, the marshland to come backwards and, and maintain um, a living shore is really the, the preferred strategy. In some places, like the airport, that might not be possible, but we want to get people educated about that now because we're going to have to make important decisions about what to do with our tax dollars to address climate change in the next um, decade or so. So if you're interested in coming to that, it's at 5.30 on Wednesday evening on the third floor of 85 2nd Street. So a plug for that. Um, we actually had a whole host of Earth Day activities this weekend. It's, it's our biggest and busiest week in the San Francisco Bay chapter. I think we've had about uh, 25 Earth Day activities all totaled. Wow. Yeah, um, and a lot of them are just the community events that I'm sure everyone was invited to. We do have a presence. We had, there was a, um, a Cesar Chavez festival this past weekend in the Mission. We were there. There was also uh, SF Earth Day as well as an event in Alameda and in Emeryville. The weekend before that was Berkeley Bay Day. I think I saw Save the Bay's table there. So we've been we've been busy. Um, Sounds like it. Yeah, and we have one more event coming up tomorrow evening. Will be a screening of A Fierce Green Fire, which is uh, a movie about the history of the environmental movement. It's free. It's at Berkeley City College, and also starting at five thirty. And it really. Um, it starts with the Sierra Club and, and the work of John Muir and then goes up to really what David Brower did in the 60s and how that kind of galvanized, um, you know, the country for a lot of the most important environmental protections that were passed um, in subsequent years. And then it kind of breaks off into where we are now, which is where there's so many organizations doing so much great work and how they all work together or kind of have their niche and, and now this kind of global movement to really combat climate change. So it's a really great rundown of, you know, where we all fit into this, this big equation and um, it was just in theaters about a month ago and, and this is one of the first free screenings that's being hosted in the Bay Area. So it, again, it's at Berkeley City College at 5.30 tomorrow evening in the auditorium. Nice. Well, we will definitely put up links about how people can get involved with that. Thank you for that wealth of information. Uh, quite a lot to chew on. So now that we have introduced all of our guests, I'd like to kind of bring it together into the discussion portion of the uh, Hangout. What we're talking about today is Earth Day, obviously, and what Earth Day means for each of us and our organizations, and what uh, we are, how we can actually promote impact on Earth Day itself. Personally, uh, for the Online Ocean Symposium and me myself, Earth Day has always had this special connection of trying to remember and recollect all the different times I've enjoyed various places on Earth and trying to use it as a day of action to actually go out and help various organizations either clean up with a restoration project such as Save the Bay or uh, even something as simple as picking up a couple pieces of trash and letting my friends know about it. Uh, Allison, I'd like to throw it to you. What are some ways that you can uh, give advice? What are some advice that you can give uh, the people watching at home about how they can participate on Earth Day? Yeah, so I would say that you know, for us, Earth Day is is an incredible reminder of kind of what you were saying of those beautiful, pristine, amazing places that you love, but also to kind of borrow from what Michelle was saying earlier, kind of the environmental justice perspective that the environment is where you live, work, and play, um, and so to think of Earth Day as kind of the, the protection of your communities and the people and places that you love and making sure that they're healthy and thriving um, and that they're healthy and thriving in a way that, um, that the rules of the game are designed to serve everybody um, and that it is incredibly important to ride your bike 
and pick up litter and do those kind of celebratory things that are part of, of kind of participating in Earth Day events, but also to write your Congress people and send in letters to the editor and work with other people in your community to change the roles of the game um, in the ways that have been done by the people who have really kind of fueled this movement before us. I just want to put like some sparkly fingers for mm -hmm. a fierce green fire. I saw it last year and it's great. Um, so if anyone needs a little in, like a little injection of inspiration, it's really quite a quite a good movie. Great to hear. I'll have to check it out. Unfortunately, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Seth, I'm going to throw it to you since you've just jumped back on. Uh, how are some ways that people can participate? And don't forget to unmute yourself. There we go. I think uh, I'm all good. Sorry about kind of coming in and out sporadically here. A few computer issues. Um, there are tons of ways for people to come out and help participate. I talked a little bit about our volunteer uh, restoration programs. Uh, they can all be signed up for online. Uh, great to come out either with uh, maybe your corporate team uh, or just your friends and family. But there's a lot you can do at home as well. Uh, we have a huge initiative called uh, Bay versus the Bag to try and ban the use of uh, single-use plastic bags around the Bay. And uh, just today, we've had a huge victory in this, in that 12 cities in San Mateo County have adopted um, San Mateo County's bag ban. And so there's now a swath of, uh, of cities running all the way from Marin down to Santa Cruz that have jumped on board and, uh, and banned the use of, uh, of plastic bags, which is, which is really great. Um, you know, it took me a, a little while to get in the habit of bringing my own bags to the grocery store, but, you know, it's just the little things that I think really help people to uh, develop habits that can um, just dramatically cut down on this million plastic bags entering the bay every year. So uh, that's a, a real easy thing to do from home. Also encourage you to check out our new campaign, which is called For the Bay, aimed at trying to reach a larger audience of, uh, of bay stewards and citizens, um, really just trying to, to spread the word on how simple it is to, uh, to help our local estuary and what dramatic impacts just these small changes can have. Yeah, you actually hit on a very important issue to me. I mentioned this to Allison on off the air, and anybody who's watched our programs before kind of knows this. When I was working for the city of San Jose, we actually uh, were working on this issue, and I was able to work with city staff on writing the actual plastic bag ban there. And it's just very important to remember that everyday choices have an impact that are beyond just your financial uh, issues or you know what food you eat. It has a much larger global uh, impact, and I actually think that this is kind of where you get into the concept of literati, where every little action you take can have a much larger impact. Jeff, can you talk on that a little? Well, it's interesting. You know, all of the, the different interests that Seth and Michelle and Allison and I represent, we're still all tied together. And I think that's, for me, what Earth Day really represents, is this connectedness and a reminder that we're all in this thing together. And it's, um, it's important to understand that if you just take one little action, whether it's riding your bike to work instead of taking your car, whether it's bringing a bag to the market instead of taking some plastic, or whether it's picking up one piece of litter, it all makes a difference. And for Literati specifically, what we're trying to do is visualize that difference, show that little actions can add up to a massive impact. That is very true and just dead on point. Uh, I'd like to throw it back to Michelle. Michelle, do you what, what do you have to say on the subject of uh, participation and ways to get out there? Sure. Well, actually, that's exactly it, getting out there. Um, you know, the theme of this year's year, uh, the Earth Day for the Sierra Club this year is actually the words get out. And what that is is just encouraging people to go out and enjoy the natural areas around us. You know, Earth Day, as much as it is an opportunity for activism, especially um, for environmental activists, it is also a celebration of what we have accomplished and the places that we have protected all throughout the country, but especially here in the Bay Area where we have, you know, amazing redwood forests and the East Bay Regional Park District and the shoreline um, that has brought, been brought back to a natural place where we can even hike all the way around it. So I would say whether it's Earth Day or Earth Month, sometime in the next few weeks, everyone should go out and just take a chance to appreciate the beautiful Bay Area, connect with nature, and really think about what we have done and what we can accomplish. 
Most definitely. I, I remember at South by Southwest Eco that you guys had, it was by you guys, I mean Sierra Club, had a little booth where people could take a photo of the places that were important to them. And I actually drew a little picture of uh, Point Ray Seashore, and I have plans of going out there in a day or two. So is there any places that everybody on uh, board have plans to go check out? Seth, what about you? Places to uh, to check out. You know, I haven't done uh, enough Mirror Woods recently, and it's really just right in our backyards, but it's such a tremendously inspiring place that uh, I'd love to uh, go spend a little bit more time up there. Um, you know, sometimes we get a little stuck in our uh, respective cities or whatnot, but the Bay Area makes it so easy to uh, get out in just half an hour or 45 minutes, and heck, if you can ride a bike there, even better. So uh, I think that one might be high up on my list. Allison, what about you? Sorry, I just had to unmute myself. Um, I, I just adopted a dog and have been spending a ton of time in Sibley on dog hikes, and it is such a beautiful kind of vantage point where you can see um, both Mount Tam and Mount Diablo and both bridges, um, mm -hmm. and it's just kind of a beautiful, incredibly accessible um, route of trails that makes me feel so happy to live here in the Bay Area. Yeah, I, I would have to say that, you know, having a little dog participant and little companion <laughs> on the ice is probably one of the best things ever for those of us who like dogs. Um, when, uh, what about you, Jeff? You know, it's interesting. Sibley is my backyard as well, and that whole Joaquin Miller and Sibley and Tilden sort of connection is such an amazing area. Um, Although I will say I'm really excited to get back to Yosemite. It's been a while um, since I've been there, and that place for me is just as majestic as it gets. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to making a trip up there in a couple of weeks, actually. Nice. So what really does Earth Day mean to each one of you? More, and, more than just getting out there and experiencing uh, things, how, are, how can we use Earth Day? to make sure that people understand that there are ways to actually make our interaction with our home, our, our spaceship flying through the cosmos, how can we use Earth Day as, through each one of our groups and all of our different partners to try, try and make sure that people understand that they can be impactful? Uh, I'm going to throw it to you, Michelle. Well, I think, again, it, it comes down to be really using Earth Day as a celebration. You know, um, we are at kind of a scary time in uh, the climate crisis and it can be very overwhelming for people but when you have these kind of galvanizing events these fun events these things where people come together and and they're taking action and they're about supporting stronger environmental protections but they're doing it in a way that builds community i think that's really what it means to me is is you know the heart of what earth day is most definitely building community and coming together impacting the uh, the output by maximizing our outreach. Uh, Jeff, what about you? You know, I love what Michelle just said about, you know, it's a celebration. The only thing I would add to that is it's also a reminder. For me specifically, it's a reminder to just be more aware of my surroundings, of my environment. I feel like we've gotten to a place where we're a bit desensitized. You know, people will walk over a broken beer bottle in the middle of the park and just keep going. And I feel like Earth Day is a good chance to just um, raise that level of awareness um, so that the next time you wouldn't just walk over it, you would put it in its proper place. Um, the sense of community is absolutely part of it, and hopefully what comes, from, comes of that is that we maintain a little bit more of that awareness and more of that sense of community the other 364 days of the year, which are frankly just as important. Yeah, most definitely. There's a meme going out there right now, make Earth Day every day, and I can't agree with that more. Uh, Seth, what about you? Other ways for impact. Seth, are you still there? And Seth is frozen, so Allison, again, back to you. Yeah, I, I'm just going to kind of echo what everyone else has said. Like, Earth Day is a party. Um, and I, everyone wants to be invited to the party, and I think that um, oftentimes, especially in the environmental community where things can be pretty bleak, um, we sometimes do a lot of kind of lecturing and finger wagging and kind of telling people how they ought to be, be doing a better job of protecting all of these things that we care about or how, you know, it's just a matter of minutes until the 
whole earth burns down in fiery flames. Um, and so being able to kind of galvanize and rally a group of people about the, the things and places um, that we love um, and, and kind of launching forth from a place of positivity and excitement and engagement, I think for me, um, is, is, an inc is an incredible reminder of the power of positivity in the work that we do. Um, and, and remembering that we do this work because we love the planet and because we love each other and why else would you bother, um, I think is something that, that for me is, is really great about Earth Day. Most definitely. I would have to agree wholeheartedly on that, especially on the concept of kind of walking the line between presenting an image of the world like, oh, everything's horrible and we need to fix everything, look at all these horrible images, and uh, experiencing the beauty of this. In fact, in one of our past Hangouts, we chatted specifically about the need to go out there, and I like how we're talking more about community building and uh, being more of a party, and Seth, since again you're back, I'd like to uh, throw it over to you. What are your thoughts on community as it revolves around making a larger impact on Earth Day and making it more of a fun and inclusive process? Absolutely, and you know, it, it all is about the numbers and getting people out there, and that's where we see huge impact. I think a lot about this idea of, of creeping normalcy or, or changing baselines, which is a term uh, coined by Surfrider Foundation, I believe. And this is something I talk with, uh, with kids about on our programs. Is, you know, they come out to the bay and they see it as this static uh, thing. And they assume it's always looked like it does now. Um, but this idea of, uh, of changing baselines, or I think Jared Diamond calls it almost landscape amnesia. I think that's somewhat disparaging to us. It's we're not, uh, <laughs> I don't think it's so much a memory issue, but a, a lack of perception in that areas like the San Francisco Bay change so slowly that we may not be able to pick up on them. Um, but that really goes both ways. You know, the Bay got to uh, the state it's in right now, uh, and it can get out of it too. Uh, and that's what we're doing is, you know, we really are actively changing our, uh, our resources for the better. And so that's what I like to remind people of is that, you know, we look at, all these environmental issues, climate change, and, uh, and all these resource scarcities, and we think, oh, this is how it is, and it's always been, and uh, you know, it's, it's too insurmountable a task to, uh, to try and, and get ourselves out of these situations. But that is not the truth. Um, there is so much that can be done, and it's about rallying those communities, uh, educating people, and then giving them really tangible ways to make a difference. Yeah, it's, uh, I would definitely agree with that, especially on the concept of not just education, but inspiring people to participate, and reminding them that we all come from nature and we're all going to eventually go back to nature. Um, one thing that was brought up by uh, Bill McGivin in a, uh, most re a relatively recent uh, Real Time with Bill Maher was this argument of adaptation to extreme climate change. Uh, versus uh, mitigating the actual effects or what the root causes are. And really, I would love to hear your guys' opinion of where the balance lies on that. Should we be, uh, while uh, we're focusing on trying to, uh, sorry, um, while we're trying to focus on trying to adapt our waste stream and change how we interact with all of our stuff, uh, shout out to the Story of Stuff Project, uh, should, how can we also be looking at ways of adapting to where the Earth is going to be going? Um, I'm going to throw that to you, Michelle. Wow, that's a good question. Oh, heavy um, question. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think really it's about building a coalition. You know, we all have a stake in this as environmental activists, but, and I think a lot of times we're thinking about where our organization's focus is and what our objectives are. And I think it's really important to think about what our common objectives are and bring together where we can and really just have a massive, uh, a massive turnout and show strength in numbers, really. And, you know, Again, I was in this meeting with the EPA this morning, and they were talking about kind of the political uh, environment that they do their work in. And, you know, they, they said there were 331 bills put forward in the United States Congress to shut down or completely defund the EPA last year alone. So it is only through really direct engagement, civil engagement, bringing up the level of knowledge that people have about these environmental issues and making sure that they are mad as hell about what's going on is that where really we need to go with this movement. 
Night Work is one of my favorite movies, and, you know, when it comes to the environmental issues, especially the fact that we are still having a debate about whether or not there is something going on with our planet is kind of making me mad as hell, so to speak. Jeff, what about you? What's your take on all this? I think you probably have to leave as many options on the table as possible. There are certainly ways that we can adapt um, to the climate change. Um, and there are certainly many actions we can take to prevent further contribu contribution to climate change. And, you know, I, I would probably be on the side that we should prevent from the source as much of the problems that we're creating. At least we know those are tangible changes that we can measure and identify, and we at least know that they are contributing to the problem. So why not try and solve it right there? That being said, there are new innovative technologies and new ways of looking at things that I think we really do need to at least um, be open to. And hopefully that combination um, will help us continue on in a positive way. Most definitely. Here, there is hoping on that. Seth, what about you? Well, I'm going to uh, approach it from more of an ecological perspective than a social one. And uh, I think that you know, looking at restoration, wetland, wetland restoration as a case study uh, it's all about allowing for organic adaptation. And when we go into an area, say it's a, it's a levee that's a bunch of bay dredge and it's super salty uh, and full of a bunch of invasive species, you know, we don't try to, to engineer this area uh, the way a landscape architect would and say, this goes here and this goes here and that's how we're going to do it. Instead, what we try and do is smatter the area with a whole bunch of native biodiversity and then allow the system to evolve as it sees fit. And so we're not trying to establish, again, a static uh, system that will look the same way for 150 years, but instead to give the area the potential, the biologic potential, to, uh, to really change and grow as bay levels come up um, and we move around where, where communities are around the bay. You know, how will this system best adapt? We want to give it the full toolkit uh, for adaptation. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, having all the tools available, we should be using those. We should be inventing new tools, and we should also be trying to re-envision how we interact with nature and all of our stuff. I'm going to be throwing this over to Allison, but I first wanted to mention that when I saw Annie Leonard uh, at South by Southwest Eco talking about our, our relationship to um, all the different items we consume, that it really made me think about how we can best utilize uh, our knowledge base about what we are using and how we're producing it and where it's ending up going. And this goes back into not just consumer responsibility, but a notion that we brought up in San Jose with uh, the plastic bag conversations about producer side responsibility. Um, Allison, can you talk a little bit more about the nature and relationship between what we consume, what we, uh, you know, just our relationship to, again, stuff, and how we can adapt that, whether or not we should be looking at it from the uh, changing the source or changing the end result. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot in that question. I would say that the kind of one of the core things is that part of why the story of stuff is effective um, is because it talks about environmental, political, um, issues, but using the stuff that we interface with on our day-to-day -day lives to help connect those dots. So it's talking about your cell phone and the metals that are mined in communities in South Africa, the glass that's being cleaned by someone in China, the way that it's being shipped across the country and um, across the globe, and then the assorted you know, forests that are destroyed, et cetera, et cetera, and really kind of look at all of the different places and people that are being impacted by our global supply chain. Um, and I would say that certainly consumers have a responsibility to buy less, buy used, resist the upgrade, and do all of those kinds of things. But I would say that overwhelmingly, um, the responsibility is on the product designers and the product manufacturers. Um, that for a lot of products, for example, a lot of stuff that we use, about 70% of its environmental impact is locked in at the design stages. Um, so it's all well and good for me to be recycling it and res disposing of it responsibly when I'm done with it. But if it's filled with all sorts of toxic substances that are going to potentially cause cancer for the communities where it's going to be disposed of, um, I, I have an issue with that. Um, and I don't necessarily think that it's my responsibility as a consumer to make sure that 
that everything that I own doesn't contain carcinogens. I, in fact, think that it should be the responsibility of the baby shampoo maker to, to, to make sure that there are no known carcinogens or neurotoxins in baby shampoo, um, that they have a responsibility as the kind of purveyor of those goods to make that happen. Um, and so that, that I, I think that there's an in incredible importance on being a kind of socially responsible adult um, in that way and kind of buying, buying in ways that are in alignment with your values. Um, but then the, the next step needs to, needs to be such that the system is designed in a way where the most sustainable, the most fair, the most kind of uh, effective product is one that is, that is kind of default available to everyone. Yeah, you actually mentioned uh, something very, very that hits home to me, especially with the oceans issue about the metals and the different materials that are needed for our our cell phones. And what a lot of people forget is that these rare earth metals, along with coming from you know remote places in Africa, are also coming from the bottom of our ocean. And not only does it take a lot of effort and a lot of energy and a lot of money to actually get these rare earth minerals down from, uh, or sorry, up from these uh, you know uh, places where various life exists, such as thermoacidophils and various other things from these vents, uh, it it can be hugely impactful on those uh, life systems, and we don't really know what the larger impact is going to be. So just even being aware that there's an issue and trying to examine what's going on with that issue, we should really uh, take a look at how we interact with all that stuff. Now we are. Coming towards the end of our hangout, and I'd like to throw it back to our participants to kind of wrap up what they got out of this hangout, what their last thoughts are uh, going forward for Earth Day. So for that, I'd like to throw it to uh, Seth. Really, I think this has been uh, wonderful to hear about all the different initiatives taking place right now, and then also looking at the uh, the social implications of them, and you know how we can change our, our social norms and values to start pushing people more in the direction of, of greater awareness. Because I think things are only going uphill from here. Uh, people really are more and more engaged, even in random conversations I have on public transit. And you know, I say I work for Save the Bay, and someone knows so much more than I thought that they, uh, they would necessarily about bag ban ordinances and, uh, and, and changes that really are directly affecting their lives. So it seems that there, there is so much, and a hangout like this, I've, this is my first Google Hangout ever, and uh, it's been so wonderful to uh, interact with everyone, hear your thoughts on these things, and also understand that there is you know, a greater awareness out there, and people are digging deeper into these issues. Uh, that's great to hear. I'm always happy to hear that there's more awareness out there, and then people are actually aware that their you know, choices make an impact. Uh, Michelle, what about you? Um, I guess, you know, piggybacking off of what Seth said, um, you know, I think that this, the story of the environmental movement and the story of the movement to fight climate change. Okay, it looks like you are freezing a little bit, so I'm going to throw it over to Allison. Yeah. Sorry, Michelle. Hello? And Michelle's back. Can you just... Go into that really quick. Sorry. Oh, uh, you're so sorry. I don't know what's... Okay, so um, basically I'm just really excited about the diverse uh, community that's coming to the table to really work on climate justice issues. Uh, you know, we see indigenous peoples. We see low-income communities of color. We see traditional, at least Sierra Club stakeholder allies and, um, you know, traditional environmentalists all coming with the same message. And I think if we're going to be effective in combating climate change and um, having all sorts of other uh, uh, conservation campaigns be successful, we really need to do that. So um, I just want to leave this conversation with the idea that if you are not currently an environmental activist, you, you may be and you don't know it. You can be an environmental activist just by taking a small action as, um, as you guys have described. You can find your church group and you can have an educational program. You can Look up in your local community. There's probably someone doing some sort of environmental justice work in your community. Get involved, even if it's just for where. And um, if it's Earth Day, great. If it's some other time, even better. Fantastic. Great message. Allison, back to you. 
Yeah, I would I would say that kind of along the same the same lines of what everyone else has been echoing. It's it's really lovely to be part of a conversation of people who are engaging in this issue from so many different perspectives. And I think that kind of what it illustrates for me is that everyone's particular passion and skill set is needed in the work that we're doing. Um, and kind of that earlier question that you were asking about the difference between like climate resilience versus stopping climate change and that it's a both and situation. And I think that oftentimes people think of kind of environmentalists or people who are activists as kind of these angry protesters. And I think that there's an incredible important role for angry protesters. But I also think that there's a role for people who want to bring snacks to the protest. And there's a role for the people who want to design the posters for the protest. And there's a role for everyone. Um, and that everyone has the power and the potential to be a change maker. Um, we have a change maker personality quiz on the Surrey of Stuff project if folks on um, the Hangout want to get a little bit more clarity around how they might be best able to plug in on these issues that kind of we need everyone's skills and abilities and it we will be stronger as a movement we will be more effective in our work and, and we will all be happier as a result of it so it's been a really lovely conversation for me well I'm very glad uh, if you get me that link to that uh, totally. Personality. I will put that on our event page and definitely take it because I love taking random personality quizzes. Uh, Jeff, your final thoughts? You know, I think when we look at some of these big problems that we're faced with as, uh, as a society, it can really seem overwhelming. So when you get a group of people together, it makes it seem a little bit more digestible. You know that that you're not in this battle all by yourself. I mean, I've never met Seth, I've never met Michelle, nor Allison, but now I feel like there's, you know, people that are on my team and I'm on theirs. Um, and that for me is very helpful. Um, the other thing I would add is that I think that when you are looking at making changes in your own personal life, it's easy to just hear all of these messages. Um, but sometimes change is very difficult. People don't like to change. And so, for us, people who are more active in this movement, I think the easier we can make the change available for people, whether that's through the way that we communicate, the way Story of Stuff did, um, or just simple messaging um, or simple product changes, the better off we are. I think we'll see much better results um, overall. So uh, I really appreciate you uh, allowing us to, to come here and, and discuss. Most definitely. It's my pleasure to have you all on here, actually. I I, you know, obviously love having these conversations. I love making sure these conversations cre are created and they can go forward. And let's keep having these conversations and actually get out there and do some action. I guess uh, my final thoughts for this would be that the best conclusion that we've come to on our Hangout today is that there's tons of ways to get out there and give back to the planet, to work together with different organizations to actually make an impact. So let's all get out there, experience nature together, and do our uh, part to... Uh, help out our own blue planet. Uh, thanks again to our awesome guests and everybody out there viewing. Happy Earth Day, everyone, and don't forget, Earth is best.